Rick and Morty vs. Dungeons and Dragons Issue 3 After Rick tells Morty that no grandson of his should go bard and Morty calls him out, Rick says that the protocol is only designed to end the simulation. Summer calls him out that Rick was scared at the world breaking apart. Rick then points out an interdimensional tracking and retrieval device and hopes that nobody would unplug it because if it lost their signal, it might assume that they had been captured by a rogue AI and would attempt to contain and destroy it, even if that meant destroying the planet. Then he says that this is a grill, being sarcastic, as it turns out that Jerry unplugged the thing to plug in a burger grill. Summer snarks that a failsafe that can be unplugged isn't safe, and Jerry agrees while showing self-awareness. Rick gets back at him by sending his burger grill to the floor, but surprisingly Jerry keeps smiling. Then, keeping with this odd running theme that everyone knows D&D just because it's a D&D &D arc, even Jerry knows how to play D&D, &D, and compliments Morty and says that he could teach him some new tricks. He impresses Morty and offers to play a game with him this weekend. Rick naturally gets furious at an idiot like Jerry one-upping him and getting Morty to prefer him, and freezes him. Morty ends up slapping him because he rants like an idiot. We didn't actually get to see his hand collide with his face though, so it barely registers. Morty invokes his right to choose every 10th adventure. Uh, I like that the writer brought that back. Morty says it's his dad's weekend, so they're gonna finish the adventure with his dad. Rick won't cheat, and Morty will get to be a rogue and Jerry gets to play wizard if he wants. The worst part about this is that Rick is going to come along to suffer through the whole thing, and the only possible explanation is that he wants to be there to try to protect them in case something goes wrong and none of them can handle it. So he doesn't have a choice. Rick says there isn't a simulator anymore, and his family suddenly has no appreciation for what he made, as Summer reveals that hard light is itchy somehow. And Beth says he kept passing by the same three trees. Morty's smart enough to realize that if there's infinite realities, there has to be a dimension where D&D &D is real. Rick says that it takes an infinite amount of time to sort through infinite dimensions. Okay, but still, he's had a ton of experience exploring dimensions in decades. Morty has good reason to believe that he's found one. And if there's an infinite amount of universes, and anything that's possible is, then there would be infinite D&D &D universes, if that's possible. Morty's smart enough to ask if he couldn't take the machine that reads the D&D books and have it compare dimensions until it find one similar enough. Because a machine that reads books can read dimensions too. I guess he means take one of the components from it. Summer says that if it takes a while, he should just do the search in a dimension with a slow chrono field so it would seem faster on their end. Rick really is making his family smarter just by being with them. The story cuts ahead, and I love Frick's dialogue here. After searching umpteen billion squintillion dimensions, he found one that not only has both strong and weak nuclear forces, but also luxuries like visible spectrums of light and oxygen, and the underlying physics of the world mimics the world of D&D 5th edition. Then Rick refuses to talk about 4th edition. That's lame, how the hell is a normal person supposed to be educated on if the comic won't explain what's wrong with it? This missed the perfect opportunity for the comic to explain what's terrible about it. I'd actually rather see a story about that than what this is going to lead to. It didn't even do a good job explaining what the differences between the editions were. I have no idea how Rick pronounced the name of that dimension, since a lot of its characters aren't even real letters. Rick says that he won't have a character this time, and instead he'll help out, provide equipment, explain the rules, and ride shotgun so they don't get killed. Why the hell Clint has it been his permanent position for the rest of the arc? You'll see what I mean. I don't know why Jerry and Beth are endangering themselves by coming here. He wants to be the dungeon master, and is told that honor isn't his to take. He's the main character of the series, of course it is. If he's upset about that, he should leave. Not make the story lame by staying here. The Dungeon Master prevents Rick from lasering him and humiliates him. I wish Rick got to have the dignity of staying home. This pissed me off when I first read the story. I really feel sorry for him. If you want to punish a character for being mean, you're supposed to have him get punched for it. Humiliation like this just goes overboard. Jerry's asked what school of magic he wants and chooses abjuration. I don't even know what that means. Rick says it's useless, but doesn't even explain why. So much for that. 
Rick falls over dazed, and the bitch Dungeon Master says it'll take a while for him to get used to having regular bones again. No nano particulate in his blood and a biological liver is what's wrong with him. Why couldn't Rick be the Dungeon Master? Seriously! I'm not very motivated to read the story at this point. Rick was the only thing that made all the focus on D&D tolerable. He added to things the mad scientist. The rest of this arc is just the most stereotypical fantasy cliché stuff ever to the point where reading it seems pointless. With a few exceptions, like, oh, these people who you think are good civilians are actually gonna turn out to be the bad guys. That was hard. Why should I care when Jerry says he wants to be 5th level and his family should be 6th because it's their first time? I don't know what that means. Is it literally as simple as it's RPG levels? Because if so, one measly level above Jerry shouldn't make any difference. And I'm just wondering why they don't all have to start out at level 1. Like in a real RPG. They're just talking about boring jargon and doing nothing right now. Jerry wants to be a half-elf. Why? I'm not even told the answer. And he has to get two extra points in, and he just trails off after that, and she just says, of course. Huh? Beth loves the way he looks like the goal is now. Beth wants to be a barbarian again. Jerry is disappointed that she doesn't want to be a cleric, and Beth satisfyingly lampshades that Morty looks too much like Friar Tuck for her taste. Thank you. Jerry tries to charm Beth, saying that the woman he knows has always had the heart of a healer. That's kind of out of character for him to actually mean. Sure, she's a horse surgeon, but he mostly just knows her as someone who insults him at every opportunity. That's not healing at all. He's just trying to persuade her by flattery because he wants a cleric on the team. Why can't they just say healer instead of cleric? What if you don't know what cleric means? Healer is self-explanatory. They could also say white mage. I guess the dungeon master is making Beth a cleric while Jerry suggests it because it makes no sense for Jerry to have that power. He says Beth can heal with a single touch now and can call upon fire from the sky, which she likes the sound of. Too bad he doesn't mention the fact that it makes sense of her to be a healer because she's a surgeon, because that's the only way it fits her character. She has to be made an elf too, to imitate him, I guess. Someone wants to be all Hunger Games and gets to be a rancher. Would it kill them to say Archer instead? I guess so. Considering this plot's treating Rick like shit out of nowhere, I got put in too bad of a mood to give the story the usual amount of leeway. So I'm gonna call bullshit on her being able to aim an arrow accurately on the first try if she can do that, because I've heard that's a lot harder than it looks. In which case, it's probably not something Summer Camp for Kids could make you a lifelong expert in, if she even went there. I can only assume that the Dungeon Master made her an expert archer, but that's not explained. It's missing some good details here. RPGs are all about how you start out sucky with no experience and have to keep beating monsters to get stronger. It'd be ridiculous to just start out a new RPG with max experience or stats, and that's essentially what they're getting. It's a bit unfair that she can just rain down holy fire at level 1. And now Summer knows how to aim a bow on top of that? That's starting to hurt my suspension of disbelief. Of all the different classes she could have, they picked the one requiring a complex skill. If the characters in the story were supposed to be the writer and comic staff, this would come off as self-indulgent and a character doesn't have to be called the writer to be a self-insert fanfiction character. Morty says he's just tired of dying in the game all the time, and Jerry says that a half-orc is as tough as you can get. Why a half-orc? You'd think an orc would be the toughest of all. I guess orcs are supposed to be mindless, bloodthirsty monsters because cliché, even though they can stand on two legs and walk like people. This is from an outsider's perspective. For all I know, some of this makes sense to someone obsessed with D&D, but to me, some of this jargon seems like dumb, nonsensical traditions. What's so special about an elf? It's just one of the nature-hugging, arrogant assholes, right? So Morty's made a half-orc rogue. It's like they're trying to make it superficially more interesting by having them be half-orc and half-elf. But why is it more interesting? What makes them any different from elves? Having it be half doesn't require much effort. I'm not reading the fucking worthless, redundant new names and backstories for the main characters. What a gigantic waste of a panel. I don't fucking care. Why the hell would anyone care? They're just made up. They're still the same people. Those aren't their real backstories. And if it's ever important to the plot, I'll learn it as I go. 
No one wants to learn backstories like this. It's a very dry, unnatural, uninteresting way of providing exposition. Rick says it's like an after-school special about the dangers of bad character builds. And that's if they all picked things at random or if Jerry gave them a list in crayon. Well, they did pick stuff on a complete impulse. I have no idea if Rick's correct. But he's a genius, so chances are he is. I wish he explained himself, but he's not allowed to explain because the writer hates him. That's the only possible explanation there is for the story happening like this. He says he's a conscientious objector. Summer encourages him to stay because it'll be fun. Even though clearly it wouldn't be fun for Rick. I wish Rick did leave. He says that Jerry picked a race with a charisma bonus when he's not working in human resources and his job is to unlock the arcane secrets of the universe. Yeah, but it impresses his ex-wife. That's smart too. But he's going on a dangerous adventure on another planet. He needs to not get killed first. Rick's portal is made to say that he runs from anything he can't control. I hate the smug look on the Dungeon Master's face and I want him to die. Seriously, so many characters die in Rick and Morty like it's nothing. To the point where one no characters might as well have a ticking time limit on them. So this guy had better get it. He's not gonna get it. Don't make a new character smug and expect him to be likable. I hate that I'm expected to believe I shouldn't be against this guy just because he's being nice and calm and polite to Rick's family, even though he's smirking and insulting Rick. By stealing the cybernetics in his body, he's robbing Rick of what makes him him and a badass. Rick says, Have you clowns given any thought as to how any of us are going to get back home? The dungeon douchebag says that once they finish their adventure, they'll return to their own world. And I find it concerning that he's not going to explain exactly how long that'll take. What if by the time they get home, Beth's fired and the house is being foreclosed on? Rick warns his family that they might end up killed or at least injured. He's told that if he won't come up with a character, one will be given to him. And he's made a stupid looking little dwarf bard on top of everything else. This writer hates Rick as a character. And this is where I raged with the story when I first tried to read it. And literally skipped to the end of the arc to see them get home. I better not be the only one in the audience who is pissed at this. I know Rick's done some bad things, but I don't care right now. Humiliating the main character like this is just infuriating. He's not being told that he's being treated like this specifically as a punishment for all the specific horrible things he's done. He thinks Rick is just some random stranger, which means he's bully one of us too. This isn't even funny. I don't see how this could be funny. Why can't it be a wizard? Oh, right. That stupid idiotic rule in D&D that there can't be more than one member of the same class. It's 5th edition! You think that I've grown the fuck up? Hey, I can destroy that rule's logic. Clerics are wizards! Clerics have magical powers, so by definition, they're wizards too. If you looked up the word wizard, it'd probably just say, Person with magical powers. So we're clerics. They're just not called wizards because they specialize in healing. If there can be multiple mages, why can't Rick be a black mage? There's red mages and white mages and black mages? Where does the wizard fall into that? Is he the black mage? If Jerry has any kind of healing powers or, or saving powers at all, that means he's a red mage because he has both types of magic. Couldn't Rick be written by the writer to be a mage too? That'd actually be taking advantage of his character because as a mad scientist, he can do crazy things. So a wizard will be similar to that. Why does he just throw the instrument and destroy it like it would actually be in character for him in the slightest instead of just going along with things like a goddamn slave? He won't just stop at refusing to come up with a backstory. Is it really true in D&D that a dungeon master can provide a class to someone if they don't want to choose it? That's terrible. If they didn't like the class, they would just walk out of the room. But Rick can't do that, so it's not really a representation of D&D. If you can pick multiple schools of magic, why couldn't there be multiple wizards with different schools? The Dungeon Master is such a douchebag for not letting Rick make a different choice. Instead, they get warped to another place. And Rick is the only one talking any sense here. The rest are unreasonably optimistic. Which is weird, because... Beth and Jerry aren't used to getting themselves in danger going on a dangerous adventure. You'd think they'd be more scared than Morty. It's out of character for them to not be too scared to go here. You'd think Morty would agree with Rick and be worried because he's a wimp. 
Summer expresses faith in Rick, saying that she's seen to make a spy drone with what he found in a grade schooler's backpack. Rick says that this is a fringe reality governed by an omnipotent god that's biased against him. I'm glad at least one person called the Dungeon Master out on it. But other characters need to too. So that it doesn't just come off like the writer hates Rick and wants us to think he's wrong just for being negative. Which is a toxic, disgusting, complainer is always wrong mentality that was supposed to have died with 80s cartoons. Which you can continue to find in every comments section in response to any kind of negativity. Then some civilian holding an unconscious wife of his calls out for help because of ogres, saying that an ogre attacks them. Why did he do that? Can I get an explanation? Or is it just going by, it's a fantasy cliche, so let's march in lockstep with it. At least Jerry's not going to be a whiny loser in this story. But he's not Jerry anymore at that point. More like a self-indulgent fanfiction insert for the writer because he's so perfect because he's got a charisma bonus. So the Dungeon Master brainwashed him by rewiring his brain to change his personality. It's pragmatic of nobody to complain about this. Also, Jerry was acting exactly as charismatic before he came to this dimension. Beth heals the woman, and after his kids remind him that he's a wimp, he says that here, he's great at killing monsters and protecting people. They get faced with an ogre holding an axe. Gee, it sure is convenient for them that in all the time Jerry was telling Summer what a haste spell in her was for, the ogre didn't kill them all. He didn't even try to attack them. He just politely stood there and waited for Jerry to make a plan first. This is bad Sonic-style writing. This is the same kind of thing I have to call out in shitty Sonic comics. They should be dodging attacks while he's telling them the plan. It would have been smarter of him to have told her about the haste spell before they'd get into danger. Like, while they were walking. Jerry tells Summer that haste will help her keep her distance. And he warns her to not draw his attention until he tries to attack him. And warns her to cast her Hunter's Mark. Why? What's that? She just has arrows. I think haste is supposed to be a fast spell. How would it let you keep your distance? I don't think the writer considered at any point that people who aren't obsessed with D&D, who never even played it before, would read this issue as well. Of course that would happen. I like Rick and Morty, and this is in that franchise. Whatever happened to having more appeal to more people? It would have made Summer look competent if she came up with its plan by herself after running away to keep her distance. I can compliment haste being used because it's more creative than just elemental spells. Jerry warns Morty, who has an inferior redesign that makes him look evil, that when he tries to attack Jerry, they should flank him and Morty should get a sneak attack in. And why the hell did Jerry have to magically know how to taunt the giants in their own language? I mean, we never saw Jerry play D&D. Even if he did waste his time learning a made-up, fully functional language from D&D instead of French or Spanish, that would have been so long ago that he'd have forgotten everything he learned. Like, the only way he'd have any chance of remembering that information is if he did a bunch of translating from English to that language for fun. He certainly wouldn't remember the giant word for location, for, for elocution, which no normal human being knows the meaning of. I'm not even trying to pronounce it. Does this writer just really prefer Jerry to Rick? That's what happens when the writing is so annoying. You think of meta reasons instead of just trusting the writing on his in-universe logic. Why would I want to be invested in its universe at this point? At this point, I'm just here to expose all of its mistakes because that's the karma it deserves for treating Rick like this. He's not even going to do anything in this fight. How can he? If the Dungeon Master was really such a great guy, he would have made Rick nice. Jerry says some words to make himself invincible to the axe attack, which is smarter than I'm hoping he would dodge it like a thought. Invincibility is more creative than elemental spells. I guess you can start a game in D&D at level 100 if you feel like, even though he just came to this universe for the first time. Sure was polite of the Dungeon Master to give him the most overpowered spell ever right from the start. How's he supposed to know Jerry's really experienced at D&D just because he says so? After their plans executed flawlessly, Jerry protects his kids from a thrown lance by summoning force fields. Rick's known for force fields too, but god forbid he get to keep that. 
And again, this is more creative than elemental magic. Since when do I get to use this in an RPG? Morty's in pain, and Jerry defeats the monster with some fire. So he does have elemental powers. I guess we'll never learn why those giants were just starting a fight. They weren't even explaining themselves. So how is Abjuration bad if it still gives you elemental magic anyways? On top of all these other cool spells. That you have to be creative and clever to figure out how they could be useful. I guess that's why Abjuration's bad? Beth says she healed that woman, but her child was stolen from her farm by orcs. By orgers. Why? We better be told why. Rick snarks about how heavy-handed it is that her kid's called Little Timmy and asks if he had a cockney accent and fake leg, too. I'm glad at least one person is as cynical and irritated as I am. The man explains at boring length why he and his wife couldn't get their kid back. The guy says that the camp is miles away and he doesn't know where it is because he's been chased all day. If it was all day, then they sure have a lot of stamina for running that far, without having to go to the bathroom or eat. And Summer says she can track a falcon on a cloudy day so she can find them no problem. Oh, that's convenient. I guess the dungeon master gave her that as part of being a ranger. What's the point if she's not the same character anymore? That feels like she's cheating. We're not seeing how Jerry and Summer would survive a D&D adventure. They only look like them. Only Morty is in character. Like, in character for experience with Rick's adventures, Morty, anyways. Ranger just makes me think of Park Ranger. Did Park Rangers really exist back in medieval times? Rick lampshades how unnecessarily cheesy it was of Jerry to say that's what heroes do when they agree to take a couple of hours to rescue a kid. Which Rick was worried was just a side mission, even though it's the first mission they were asked to go on. I guess Jerry only had so much extra charisma if he thought this line was okay. Jerry says that his arcane wards are stuff that only abjurers can do, so Rick probably doesn't know about it. So, it's force field stuff like Rick can do. So it's pretty ironic that Rick doesn't like abjuration. You'd think after all the times force fields were useful to him, he'd respect them. But I totally get that he'd rather have the cool magic he usually doesn't have in exchange, like fire. But didn't Jerry use fire? Like something else, I mean. Jerry says he's had a lot of free time since he moved out, and there's been a lot of solo adventures. Uh, I thought it was impossible to play D&D solo. That's kind of the whole problem with it. Morty relates to Jerry about being alone too much. Summer complains that she can hear Morty because rangers have really good hearing. Oh, how convenient. Sure, it's nice that all these characters have new powers be more competent, but they just got them as gifts and their brains were rewired to be this way. It's not really having the same impact as it would if the real characters had those. It's just for this one arc anyways. Jerry says that he noticed he seems different here. His head feels clear. A lot of things are obvious that never occurred to him before. I didn't know being smarter was an integral part of charisma. I thought it was the opposite because smart people don't always get listened to and even when they have the obvious right idea. Jerry explains why Rick said charisma was a dump set. Rick is a power gamer who plays the idea like it's a math problem. Yeah, he's a mathematical genius, that's the way he is. There's nothing inherently wrong with that as long as he's still having fun. Jerry says he doesn't need to be the smartest wizard and would rather play someone brave, clever, and charming. Someone interesting who knows the right thing to do. And he says that the whole fun of D&D is getting to be someone you're not. Meanwhile, Rick's drinking because he apparently has access to that after all. And that just reminds me of how he's supposed to be and makes it all the more aggravating. Why didn't he insist on going home if he's not going to do anything because he thinks he can't do anything? That's what's so insulting. It's actually worse to have Rick here and barely getting to talk or do anything than it would be if he was at home, with the writing being honest that it's a side story meant to give these characters a moment in the limelight. That'd be like if Sonic was in the Tales miniseries the whole time, and he was just barely talking and doing nothing. It's smart that they have to keep watch at night. Beth says it's her turn for watch, and fortunately she's upset at what happened to that woman and wonders if they can even do this. I hate that she's calling Jerry by a name other than Jerry. I'm not doing that. He's Jerry. I like that Beth tried to take Jerry down a peg by telling him to just give her the short version and explain how many monsters they'd have to fight at camp. He says dozens. Jerry says he likes that his family's working together and says that he always wanted to protect his family. 
The next morning, they go fight some monster, Beth heals, and thank God, it immediately gets back to progressing the plot because they've already found the camp. Morty asks what are those because they look different than the others. Summer says they're half ogres, and like all giants, they're child-eating monsters they have to wipe out. Jerry says there's more than 40, and it doesn't make any sense. The couple is right with them, apparently. The couple reveals that their child is going to be used as a sacrifice to an evil god. Why did it take so long for them to tell them this? Rick calls this out as cliché, but if the writer knows it's cliché, he better not actually play it straight, because having a character make fun of a boring concept doesn't make it good. Jerry says there's too many to fight, and Morty says it's a good thing they brought a thief to steal the baby back. Morty says that making a diversion would be a rookie move, even though he's less experienced at D&D. And Jerry making a diversion worked out perfectly. He says that if things go wrong, then Jerry should make a diversion so he can slip out with the kid. And he tells him he has to trust him because this is what he does. Even though it's not what Morty does. This is the kind of thing I hate about this arc. What's the point of reading about it if it's not really Morty and it's that original fanfiction character? Summer gives Morty a spell called Pass Without Trace. You'd think the rogue would have that. That's awfully convenient. So, I guess her brain was rewired so that she'd instinctively know all her spells and not question that. It doesn't feel like Summer, then. Summer shoots someone with an arrow, and Jerry casts Misty Step to protect Morty. I hate that he calls him Kerr instead of Dad. At least he thanked him. The heroes keep fighting as Jerry keeps saying Counterspell. At least an aperture is unique to show off. He gets smacked, not that I actually see it hit him. And as was foreshadowed, there's too many for them to deal with. Beth gets hit by lightning, and Jerry says a spell to get rid of all the bad guys with a flood of water. Then the farmer couple brag about getting a magical shard, which was their plan all along. Why is the guy calling them fools? He could have reasonably kept them thinking they were in the right, instead of getting the heroes after them. They're not automatically evil just because they want a magical gem, so why do they have to be portrayed as laughing and smirking just because of that? The woman says that with this half-breed child, they have what they need after decades of searching to fulfill the prophecy of darkness. More like prophecy of cliché names. Why are they telling the heroes this? They would have never known to go after them. She says that six shall fall and six shall rise. So they warp away and kidnap someone's baby as he's crying, which is the real reason they're evil. If taking a magical gem makes you evil, that makes Sonic evil. So there's a big twist where the couple they initially helped turn out to be lying and evil, because it's Rick and Morty. It's so satisfying to see Jerry upset and confused and ask if they're the bad guys. They don't have to be, they just got tricked one time. Also, if they had listened to Rick, none of this would have happened, because he was wondering if this was a mandatory mission or a side mission and wanted to skip it. But I guess if they skipped it, then they'd never be able to complete their adventure according to the Dungeon Master so they'd never be able to escape. Now, how is Rick supposed to know that? I hate this story. I just can't help but hate what it does to Rick. It is kind of interesting to see his family be more competent with magical powers and skills, but it doesn't really feel like them. They only have these abilities because the smug douche Dungeon Master God gave them the powers. I guess he's really bored and this is his only entertainment. What's really immersion breaking is that they don't even question that they suddenly have these abilities. It's all about them going to a D&D dimension that the writer thankfully took great care to justify Rick managing to find. And after they try to help a couple get their baby back, it turns out they're just a bunch of baby nappers who want to fulfill a prophecy after decades of obsession with it. Good thing for the heroes they told the heroes this, so they knew to go after them. What's the point of the story if the characters don't feel like the characters? The worst part is that Rick barely talks and does nothing as an insulting dwarf who somehow keeps the guitar with them. It'd actually be less insulting if he was simply allowed to go home like he wanted. That's like when Sonic wanted to leave the cruise ship in Sonic X and wasn't allowed to. But at least they're at a point because them wanting to escape was the whole premise of the plot. But here, Rick doesn't do anything. So he didn't need to be here. Those cynical snarks are a welcome relief whenever they show up showing self-awareness in the writing. He's the only relatable character in the whole story when he's surrounded by annoyingly perfect optimists. I guess if I have to give this story a really big compliment, aside from the obvious 
there's a twist where the guys who seemed good were actually evil and vice versa. It was creative that there was an abjurer and he had spells that you couldn't use in RPG. 